Uh, it's really an honor for me to, to open this year's Alice Amston Memorial Lecture. Um, welcome to or members of the Airport uh, Steering Committee and all participants uh, who are here. Airport's Amston Memorial Lecture um, was started in her honor in 2014. Um, Alice had been a, a very strong supporter of Airport, and she gave very generously of her time as a lecturer on the program, um, even in, as she became unwell um, in the final years. I'd like to preface the lecture with a few words about Amston's seminal work. She was a leading thinker on industrial policy and an expert in economic development. She served as the Barton L. Weller Professor of Political Economy in MIT's Department of Urban Studies and Planning. Emerson wrote extensively about the process of industrialization in emerging economies, with a particular focus on, on Asia and uh, East Asia in, in particular. Her work was very influential in understanding the importance of state-led industrialization and development. She focused on, on the catch-up experience of late industrializing economies. Um, and in her work, she, she found that uh, growth was achieved through government intervention that used price control and import replacement policies, uh, that promoted organizational learning and that established reciprocal control mechanisms between states and private firms to guarantee the effectiveness of state incentives. Her work effectively challenged uh, the notion that globalization had produced uh, generally uniform conditions in which emerging economies could find a one-size-fits-all path to prosperity. Past Amsden Memorial lecturers have included uh, Stephanie Seguino, the late Tandikam Kandawere, Adeyemi De Peolu, Stephanie Blankenberg, and Carlos Lopez. Hopefully, uh, from next year, we'll be able to revert to holding uh, these lectures in person. Um, this year, we're very fortunate to have Jose Antonio Ocampo um, delivering uh, the lecture. Uh, and thank you, Jose Antonio, for making time for it uh, this afternoon. Jose Antonio Campo is professor uh, at the School of International and Public Affairs, um, co-president of the Initial Initiative um, for Policy Dialogue, uh, that's the IPD, and member of the Committee on Global Thought at uh, Columbia University in New York. He's also chair of the Committee for Development Policy of the United Nations Economic and Social Council, ECOSOC, um, as well as serving as chair of the Independent Commission for the Reform of International Corporate Taxation. He teaches regularly, um, apart from at uh, Columbia, also at uh, Universidad de los Andes and other Colombian universities, Colombian universities. Um, he's occupied um, numerous positions at the United Nations um, and in his native uh, Colombia. Um, including as United Nations Under Secretary General for, for Economic and Social Affairs, uh, as e Executive Secretary of uh, UN ICLAC or CEPAL, um, and holding a number of uh, senior leadership positions um, in Colombia, including as Minister of Finance, Minister of Agriculture, Director of the National Planning Office, um, and member of the Board of Directors of Colombia's uh, Central Bank. Um, he's received uh, numerous academic distinctions, um, including the, the 2012 um, Haumi Vicens Vives, excuse my pronunciation, um, award of the, the Spanish Association of Economic History um, for the best book on Spanish or Latin American economic history, and the 2008 Leontief Prize for advancing the frontiers of economic thought, and the 1988 Alejandro Angel Bar National Science Award of Colombia. He's published extensively on uh, macroeconomic theory and policy, on international financial issues, on economic and social development, international trade, and on um, Colombian and, and Latin American economic history. So in summary, I can say um, that Antonio, Jose Antonio is a, is a leading global thinker who's really been at the interface of um, international policy um, and, and research um, over many decades. Um, he's made uh, seminal contributions uh, to structuralist thought um, and on uh, various facets of, of economic development. So we are really honored um, that he's agreed to, to deliver this year's Alice Amston Memorial Lecture, uh, and we're very much looking forward to, to listening to him. So uh, over to you, Jose Antonio. Well, thank you very much, uh, Fiona, and thank you for that uh, very uh, kind uh, introduction. Let me. Uh, let me say that it's uh, a truly, a truly, an honor to uh, 
uh, to be with you today to uh, in this celebration uh, of not only one of the greatest uh, uh, economists uh, in the development field, uh, but uh, I must say a great friend of mine, uh, Alice Hampton. So I, I feel uh, extremely happy to be able to, uh, uh, to, uh, to give the lecture and thanks to all of you for uh, being uh, with me today. Let me, uh, uh, let me try, let me share my presentation, the, um, uh, which uh, uh, actually uh, uh, works on, uh, on this field that uh, Alice uh, was the, the, one of the greatest global experts, uh, uh, which uh, you know, I call the structural dynamics and industrial policy. So let me start by you know, some, um, basic insights uh, which i will develop over the next uh, you know hour or so um, uh, the 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 first point uh, is that successful development is essentially a process of a structural change uh, so it de depends on the dynamics of production structures and and then the policies and institutions that are put in place by governments to uh, to promote it uh, and this uh, relates to uh, something that uh, I will call the dynamic efficiency, uh, uh, which is the, the capacity uh, of uh, economies to uh, uh, engage in that structural, in, in a successful structural transformation. I, uh, let me emphasize the issue of successful because there are structural transformations uh, that are not necessarily successful. I, I will point out that through my presentation. Uh, but the uh, you know dynamic efficiency, as I call it, uh, is uh, the capacity to uh, uh, to change the structural transformation, uh, the structure of production of the economies in a way to facilitate economic growth. And the essential uh, uh, issue uh, uh, from the point of view uh, of economic policy is that there there is a many times a conflict between uh, dynamic efficiency and a static efficiency. So, uh, you know, uh, so the uh, let me, uh, one, one simple way of putting it is that the, uh, you know, comparative advantages uh, in, in traditional uh, trade analysis may not be uh, a, the, 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 the road uh, a, to dynamic efficiency. And therefore, sometimes you have to introduce policies that um, uh, are seen uh, as conflicting with uh, a static efficiency, but that generate, uh, you know, the uh, a rapid economic growth through a structural transformation. Now, in this issue, uh, there are many, many contributions uh, in, in the development literature, uh, uh, including, of course, uh, those of Alice Amden. And let me uh, let me say that uh, some uh, uh, ideas of classical development economics uh, uh, you can include within that broader uh, a set of literature, uh, uh, including uh, let me say the uh, the Latin American tradition of uh, structural economics, uh, you know, Latin American structuralism, uh, uh, which uh, is one of those uh, uh, classical development economics uh, contributions. But in most uh, recent times, uh, we have had the uh, 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 the new Schumpeterian theories, the um, the evolutionary economics, uh, and other schools of thought uh, that, uh, particularly the, those that uh, uh, analyze the issue of learning, uh, as well as the economics of scale, scale and agglomeration. Let me say also that in the case of uh, economies of agglomeration, of course, this goes back to the uh, Many contributions uh, of the in you know since the 19th century, uh, which actually uh, uh, on, on regional economics, uh, uh, which uh, remain far from uh, let's say the the field uh, of international economics, but which had been uh, most recently incorporated uh, in different ways into that uh, uh, analysis. And I said uh, uh, there are many cases of disappointment. Uh, um, uh, uh, with the structural transformation processes. And actually, uh, uh, one of those disappointments uh, is precisely the one that affects the region of the world in which I, I come from, uh, in Latin America. 
Eh, Latin America eh, eh, underwent a, a set of market reforms uh, in particular, well, they started in Chile in the second half of the 1970s, uh, but they became widespread in the mid 1980s to the mid 1990s. And the expectation was that those market reforms uh, will, uh, will lead to, uh, uh, to rapid economic growth uh, by a, a basically a, a, a more active uh, insertion into the global economy. Well, let, let's put it uh, clearly, uh, that has been a great disappointment uh, on, a, you know, the, uh, I guess the uh, concept that is being used today, uh, or the two concepts that are using, that we're being used today is the, the one of the middle income traps, which uh, I will refer in my lecture, uh, but also the premature deindustrialization, uh, which has been um, a, a characteristic of Latin America uh, uh, over the past uh, 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 three decades in the 90, well, actually four decades because they started with the debt crisis uh, of the 1980s. So let me, first of all, uh, present what I, I would call the, you know, three families of stylized facts. And they get into uh, my analysis, my uh, conceptual analysis of, of these issues uh, in terms of uh, the role of industrial policy. Uh, but uh, and then uh, with some macroeconomic issues, I, um, in a sense, I'm more of a macroeconomist, and therefore, uh, you know, the relation between industrial policy and macroeconomics is uh, has been one of my areas of work uh, th uh, through the years. Uh, and finally, you know, some conclusions. So, in in terms of stylized, the uh, the first set of stylized facts that uh, I will uh, refer to. Uh, uh, is the uh, the persistence uh, of large uh, uh, global inequalities. Uh, uh, there was this idea in, uh, in growth theory, neoclassical growth theory, uh, that there would be a, a, a tendency to a, a convergence uh, in development levels uh, as developing countries absorb uh, the um, you know the technologies of the advanced countries uh, under for catch up in terms of productivity. But that basically, basic concept has been essentially wrong. Uh, and, uh, and what we have is actually uh, the persistence uh, of uh, large inequalities in the world economy. Uh, and very few countries that do that, uh, a, a successful transition, let's say from low income to middle income, uh, and, uh, or from middle income to high income countries. And actually some countries that fall behind uh, and, uh, and go back, let's say, in the development process. Um, and, is, uh, and that reflects, of course, uh, the fact that uh, there are a huge, uh, or, you know, uh, variations in, uh, in the growth experiences uh, in the developing world. Uh, there are, you know, the, the low income traps, which is, was a topic of classical development economics, but also, as I pointed out, some middle income traps. So the fact that countries get trapped uh, at middle income levels, you know, Latin America actually being perhaps the best example in the world, uh, but also, you know, some other uh, middle income countries that uh, have not been able to, to rise up to, to high income levels. And, uh, and that is, uh, you know, uh, some things that, you know, uh, you can call it in different ways, but there are some where you can call truncated convergences, uh, which actually is, uh, it's a feature of uh, also some middle income countries. Uh, for example, I mean, a, a one remarkable case uh, in, in, is actually Brazil in Latin America, uh, which was uh, for some time one of the fastest growing economies of the world. Uh, in the, let's say from the 1950s to the 1970s, but then was uh, you know was trapped in a, a, in, a, in a middle income level, uh, and the growth rate uh, fell substantially. Uh, but I, I must say that's a, a, a fairly general experience of Latin America, which uh, actually grew at an annual rate of 5.5% in between 1950 and 1980, uh, and has grown uh, half of that uh, uh, half of that rate, 2.7% uh, per year uh, since 1990. Uh, so the you know the you know that you can call it a truncated convergence. Uh, Brazil again being a, a remarkable example. And there are all other cases which you can say is open divergence. So the countries that simply don't grow 
uh, fast uh, ever. And, and so they, they don't experience any stage of convergence. But there are, of course, uh, in these uh, variants of growth experiences, the, the success uh, uh, of uh, uh, particularly of Asian and particularly of East Asian countries uh, in the last few decades. Uh, and therefore, you can say, you know, one way I have called this in my uh, in, in, in my writings is a dual divergence. So you have a, a divergence between developing world and developed countries, but you have also a, 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 a divergence in growth experiences among uh, developing countries. And there, of course, uh, that is associated with, uh, uh, with other factors, uh, you know, basically the agglomeration associated to the development of uh, a, of value chains uh, at the international level, uh, you know, clusters uh, of develop uh, clusters of economic activities uh, that uh, are behind these uh, divergence in experiences uh, among uh, uh, countries. So one of the basic problems uh, is uh, uh, what, what came to be known as the middle income trap, uh, on which, uh, uh, of course, there is a a wide spread literature, including actually a book that I co-edited on this specific topic in recent years. Now, the, the, the problem here uh, is the high concentration of research and development uh, in the developed countries, uh, and, uh, and, uh, which is related, of course, to the high entry costs into the technologically dynamic activities, okay? Uh, and, uh, and this is reflected in, in many ways uh, in, the, in the global economy. Uh, one of the processes being the asymmetries uh, between firms that lead and suppliers in global value chains. So in global value chains, uh, in a sense, you have in the beginning of the value chain, at the end of the value chain, uh, you know, the, uh, the leading firms that, that provide technology and they provide the uh, marketing, let's say, services uh, for, you know, the, the uh, the goods are goods that are produced, uh, and generally, the, in the in the middle, you have a, a lot of assembly activities, uh, many of a simple character, uh, that do not, uh, uh, you know, lead to uh, to rapid economic growth, and uh, rather than those assembly activities, uh, may generate uh, or maybe one of the reflections of the middle income trap. There are also, uh, of course, uh, differences domestic financial development that may. Uh, also uh, lead to uh, to lack of convergence of, of developing countries. The the issue, uh, the volatility in external financing and terms of trade, which is the macro issues, which I will refer to uh, in my presentation, including the the fact uh, that there is uh, a, you know limits or constraints uh, on countercyclical macroeconomic policies. We saw that uh, clearly during this uh, COVID nineteen crisis. Uh, in the uh, very uh, huge asymmetry between the capacity uh, of developing countries to, to adopt a very expansionary fiscal and monetary policies, uh, while uh, many developing countries and particularly low-income countries were unable to do uh, equally uh, strong countercyclical policies. There's, of course, uh, the uh, additional project uh, asymmetry associated to the building up of institutions uh, uh, that uh, can take into account the interests of diverse, diverse uh, actors. This is one of the uh, many uh, ways of putting this. this is actually from a World Bank report uh, a, a, of, a, of a few years ago. Uh, but what is interesting here is you have the middle income trap in the begin in the middle, the poverty trap. There are of course some uh, a country that you know get out of that of those traps. But you can say the, the overcoming the middle income trap is very limited and is basically concentrated uh, in, uh, in some uh, East Asian uh, and uh, European economies. So you have here, for example, South Korea, Singapore, Hong Kong, uh, uh, but you have Spain and Ireland also. Uh, but otherwise, uh, you know, and I guess Latin American countries are basically, uh, you know, in this, uh, um, uh, a middle income trap. Uh, and you see, of course, that there are some uh, countries that, uh, that uh, overcome the poverty trap, uh, but they are still far from overcoming the middle income trap. Uh, China 
uh, being, of course, the, um, a, a remarkable example in that regard. And then they are high-income countries tend to reproduce themselves in the high-income level. So this is the, uh, uh, a, the best reflection of the fact that there is no such a thing uh, as a, a convergence in income levels uh, in, in the world economy. My second um, um, stylized or family of stylized facts uh, uh, indicate that the structural change is the essence of successful economic growth. Uh, and in that regard, uh, uh, in, uh, in my writings and in my lectures to, to my students, uh, I, I, I think that I differentiate between what I call the balloon versus the structural views of economic growth. Balloon is, for example, the solo model. The new, most of the neoclassical models are balloon models. So you inflate them by putting capital uh, or technology uh, in, into the, and, and then they inflate uh, in a kind of a uniform way. Uh, that view is, is, uh, uh, is in contrast with the, what I call the structural views, uh, which you can say, well, relate to Sean Peters analysis of how uh, uh, economic systems uh, develop over time, uh, which is not by inflating uh, you know, through capital accumulation uh, or technology or, or human capital, but rather by developing new sectors of production. Uh, and, uh, and therefore the capacity to develop those new sectors of production, those, uh, do, do, those new dynamic activities, uh, is the, the essence uh, of, of economic growth uh, in those models. And the point of view, which is uh, 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 very important, uh, is of course that the, uh, uh, that the, the patterns of specialization uh, at the international level matter, uh, as we will see in the, in the graphs, uh, in the, ne the next few graphs. Uh, and, and let me say that there is a repetitive phenomenon of what Schumpeter called creative destruction. So the development of new activities uh, is associated with the decline of other activities. Uh, and sometimes they happen in different places. So you create new activities in one part of the world uh, at the cost of activities that are dismantled uh, uh, or enter into, a, into decline in other parts of the world. I mean, this is, of course, you can think of many, many cases in, the, in world history uh, where you know, that process has taken place. Um, so the, the point is that the success of structural transformation very, you know, largely associated to international specialization patterns uh, are uh, the, the key to successful economic development. And the, uh, most of the countries that uh, have failed in increasing market shares at the international level are exporters of primary goods and natural resource intensive manufacturers. So this is a, the, the particular case uh, in which you see the problem. Uh, and, and there is in this regard a fallacy of composition effect, uh, um, which is typical of commodity markets. Uh, and the fact that you know, sometimes, of course, some countries are successful uh, in, uh, in increasing their share in, uh, in commodity market, but the commodity market as a whole don't grow uh, as fast. Uh, it depends, of course, on, on the type of commodity. I mean, there, there are, of course, very dynamic commodities in different uh, phases of history. For example, there is now the, uh, the, the issue that, you know, copper uh, is com becoming, uh, you know, a very dynamic uh, a commodity. But at the same time, there are other commodities that are simply not dynamic. Uh, and if you specialize in, in those commodities, there, you know, you are trapped uh, into, uh, into a, a relatively slow economic growth. I mean, let me, uh, since I'm from Colombia, let me perhaps underscore uh, coffee uh, as one of those uh, particular cases. Of course, Vietnam uh, has been in recent decades a very successful uh, country in increasing its share in, uh, in, the, in, the, in world coffee markets. Uh, in, in fact, replacing Colombia as the second world producer of coffee. But that has been at the cost of other coffee producers, including Colombia. <laughs> uh, so the, uh, so there's, a kind, there's a clear fallacy of composition uh, in that regard. But there are other factors uh, 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 which relate actually to, to the linkages uh, and the, uh, uh, you know, the in, uh, learning processes associated to, uh, to other uh, goods. And, uh, and in that regard, of course, uh, 
uh, the uh, the uh, producer, the production of a uh, middle uh, middle skill and high skill manufacturers uh, is the key to you know to rapid uh, technological learning and, and productivity change, uh, and that's what is behind the success uh, of the East Asian uh, economies. So this is uh, from an old paper that I wrote uh, uh, sometime some a decade ago or so. Uh, in which I actually uh, estimated uh, uh, with uh, Maria Angela Parra uh, the growth rates uh, uh, of countries, per capita growth rates, based uh, on their dominant pattern of international specialization, uh, which uh, following Sanjaya Lal, uh, we classify in uh, high-tech manufacturing, mid-tech manufacturing, low-tech manufacturing, natural resource-based manufacturers, and primary goods. And you see, particularly for the period uh, 1990 to 2006, uh, there is a, a, a declining uh, uh, a rate of growth as you move from high-tech manufacturers to primary goods. And that is even more remarkable if we take uh, the 1980 to 2006 period. Uh, so the specialization in, uh, in, uh, in, in middle and high-tech manufacturers do uh, does matter. And this is from a, a, a very well-known paper by Hausman, Wang, and Roderick, uh, in which they uh, basically uh, uh, estimate the, uh, uh, what they call the quality of, uh, uh, of exports uh, uh, based on, uh, um, uh, on their characteristics for, from the point of view of uh, high-income country exporters. Uh, and they relate to, uh, to the uh, growth of a uh, uh, exports. And we see here clearly the, the, the more quality based your export basket is, the more you grow. And this is the, uh, the famous uh, 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 cluster of uh, economic activities uh, developed by Hasman, Hidalgo, and Klinger, uh, in which, uh, you know, basically uh, at the center you have you know, a lot of industrial, uh, uh, basically middle-income high technology activities. Uh, and, the, um, uh, and there are, of course, uh, uh, you know, many other uh, places in the, in, the, in the specialization pattern. Uh, this is the, for example, the low labor intensive manufacturers. Uh, and, and there are some, you know, natural resources based manufacturers in the periphery of the system. Uh, so uh, as I said, the, uh, in, uh, to my student, uh, this is the, the best reflection of what the Raul Previs called the center periphery system. <laughs> you know, if you are at the center, you are at the core uh, of, uh, of economic activities uh, uh, with the significant uh, progress, uh, but you uh, are a, a low, low labor intensive producer or natural resource producer, you are in the periphery uh, of the global economy. And finally, in this regard, uh, this is the association between GDP growth and manufacturers. Uh, so, the, so the more um, uh, you specialize in manufacturers, the higher uh, uh, tends to be your uh, rate of growth. The third uh, family uh, of, uh, uh, of path dependence that is what, the, uh, is what I is basically associated to the literature on path dependence uh, and learning. Um, and this basically relates to the uh, dynamic economy of scales uh, uh, associated to learning, uh, uh, which uh, uh, actually mean that uh, 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 com comparative advantages can be created. Uh, but it's very important uh, what is the linkage between uh, uh, you know, the, uh, your specialization on your production experience. So if you uh, start to produce uh, uh, new uh, goods or services, uh, you know, the learning process uh, associated to that uh, uh, will tend to generate uh, 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 economic growth. Uh, and therefore you can, even if you are not initially uh, competitive, uh, you through that learning process, uh, you can become uh, creative. And this is uh, the basic idea, idea of that comparative advantages can be created. And I think the, Let's say the new uh, uh, trade theory associated to the work of, uh, of Paul Krugman uh, uh, is, was uh, uh, the best contribution to that idea. Uh, 
uh, that you know that actually comparative advantages can be created uh, by uh, by specializing in in those sectors. And I think the experiences of many many uh, East Asian economies, in particular, are the best examples uh, that they they can actually create comparative advantages. And in contrast to that, the loss of production experience, uh, for example, if you uh, if in, uh, uh, through uh, uh, increasing in uh, imports, uh, uh, you deindustrialize, uh, like many Latin American countries have. Then the, the lack of uh, or your production experience uh, in in the sector that you you have lost uh, in the changes in your specialization patterns means that the your capacity to uh, to produce and export those goods has de uh, declined substantially. So the the uh, there is a strong link uh, between uh, uh, productivity. Uh, and, um, uh, and, uh, and production uh, associated to in what in the old literature was called learning by doing, uh, but which is a, you know, it's a very dynamic process, uh, you know, which generates uh, these dynamic economies of scale. Now, based on, on those, uh, um, let's say, stylized facts, uh, let me uh, uh, see how uh, I analyze the dynamics of production structures. And I basically say th there are two basic forces uh, uh, that we have to take into account, uh, what I call innovations and complementarities. Uh, innovations, uh, in my view, have to be defined in a broad sense. Uh, and I generally use the, uh, the work of uh, John Peter, uh, what he calls new combinations. Uh, which is not only uh, a, a new technologies, uh, uh, but also uh, new ways of doing all things, uh, a, a new uh, a ways of marketing, uh, new uh, ways of administering, uh, uh, and of course, the learning processes uh, associated to the, uh, the development. We generate the dynamic economy of scale, uh, which I have just mentioned. And the second are the complementarities, the linkages, networks, and value chains uh, uh, among firms uh, um, uh, and the institutions uh, required for, the, for their full development, which uh, means uh, basically information channels, uh, but also uh, ways of interacting uh, that do generate or do not generate uh, a significant amount uh, of linkages uh, uh, in, a, in a particular sector. Now, I, I am one of those who thinks that the, the development of those, I mean, of course, those linkages can be done internationally through, uh, through global value chains, uh, but the capacity to do it uh, in your own territory uh, is, uh, is quite, quite important. Uh, uh, when you see the OECD data, the, actually the OECD WTO data uh, on, the, uh, on what is the, the proportion uh, or domestic value added in your exports, uh, uh, you see uh, uh, huge differences among manufacturing, pro uh, manufacturing producers. Uh, China, for example, being the, one of the uh, uh, top cases with more than 80% uh, of domestic value added in their manufacturing exports. Uh, you know, uh, uh, Korea, for example, being also a, uh, a country where that share of uh, domestic value added has been increasing. And in contrast to that, for example, Mexico and Vietnam, uh, uh, where the, uh, uh, those, uh, the domestic value added uh, is uh, very limited. So the linkages uh, uh, or value chains uh, at the domestic level uh, is, uh, is a very important uh, for, from the point of view uh, of dynamic uh, economic growth. So this link between innovations and complementarities uh, for me, uh, is the key to uh, uh, to a successful uh, a structural transformation, and of course, a, a complementary factor uh, is the uh, elastic supplies uh, of factors of production, uh, uh, which means uh, you know quality labor, uh, a, a, a capital financing, let's say, of, of the dynamic activities, uh, and uh, uh, and in those cases where you have the natural resources. Uh, a, a basis uh, for the production, let's say, uh, a, a, the access to those natural resources. And the combination of, all, of these things is what the, the, uh, generates the, 
what I call the dynamic efficiency of a given production system. Learning, uh, excuse me, the, uh, in respect to the innovation, the learning process is, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is of course a, a key. Um, and, and then in that process, um, uh, you can say there's a mix of creative destruction to, to borrow from uh, Schumpeter, uh, or you can say between substitution and complementary effects. So the, the new activity generate uh, complements um, uh, that you know that may lead through uh, uh, to other uh, 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 learning processes by other firms, uh, but also uh, substitution. You, you substitute the previous production, and therefore you have a destruction, a creative destruction. Uh, in in the best of cases, uh, I'll, 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 I'll uh, make uh, some remarks on that later on. Okay. Now, in the industrialized world, uh, technical change is of course the engine. Uh, in the developing world, uh, we basically have the transfer of sectors that have been developed by industrial countries. Uh, although, um, uh, uh, the uh, you know, of course, in the in the successful stories of China or uh, uh, let's say of, or Korea, uh, you start to enter into the world of uh, uh, of leader uh, of the world of leaders of in technical change. Uh, and then you for you you mix uh, what is simply the uh, uh, the transfer of technology from industrial countries uh, to uh, becoming leaders in in the generation of technology. Now, no, okay, okay. Do you hear me? Okay, yes, because I, I I was muted for a few minutes. <laughs> uh, okay, now. Uh, so this uh, issue of of, uh, of uh, climbing the ladder uh, in the world hierarchy of of technology, uh, you know, is a is a very important process for those leaders uh, of leading countries that uh, are able to leading developing countries that are going to are able to to uh, to uh, overcome the middle income trap. Uh, and, and then, therefore, you can say different ways of doing it, uh, shortening the transfer periods. Uh, but also becoming a, a more active partner, uh, part, participant in the generation of new technology. Uh, and let me say again, China and, uh, uh, and Korea being leaders in that regard, but th there are some other cases. For example, the uh, innovations in agriculture in Brazil and Argentina is another case in which they are leaders uh, in their own field, uh, not necessarily manufacturing, but uh, certainly uh, in uh, well, in the case of Brazil, uh, you know, small aircrafts manufacturing is also a, a leading uh, sector with a, a with significant you know a, a impact on the on the on the technology uh, frontier. Let's say. Now, following the evolutionary school, uh, a, you can say that the um, that the technical change. Uh, has uh, three attributes that are uh, very important uh, and which uh, are the reasons why uh, you want to, uh, to be very active in the state intervention uh, in the process of uh, science and technology and innovation. Uh, the, first, the first one is that technology is always incompletely, incompletely available and imperfectly tradable, uh, which uh, really means uh, that uh, you don't copy the technology, you actually uh, adopt the technology and then learn to use it. And therefore the second attribute uh, is that uh, the proficiency in the use of that technology uh, cannot be detached from production experience. Uh, and the third one uh, is that uh, you cannot appropriate all the benefits from your learning, uh, not from technological learning, but even less from marketing, uh, learning from marketing or administration, uh, which can be copied by your competitors. Uh, and therefore the uh, innovations always have uh, this mix of private and public attributes. Uh, there are other reasons why uh, it is very important for states uh, uh, to promote uh, the, the, uh, the process. Now, what this means is that you have to have, uh, you know, institutions uh, uh, that uh, uh, that help to develop, uh, you know, uh, in the in and to promote innovations, 
uh, uh, which uh, you know are you know networks of producers, uh, uh, marketing channels, uh, or uh, and then you have organizations that disseminate information and provide coordination, and of course you have the demand effects and the supply effects uh, uh, that are typical uh, uh, of, uh, uh, and we'll see graphically that that uh, later on. Uh, and in the case of, uh, of linkages, uh, uh, which is what I'm talking about now, uh, the, the other is, uh, is the critical role uh, of, uh, uh, of uh, non-tradable inputs and specialized services, uh, which imply that you are, you know, uh, the, com the competitiveness of, it in the, of a specific sector that you develop uh, uh, requires, uh, you know, some, the development of other activities next by uh, which uh, you know generate positive externalities on your economic activity. Uh, this is knowledge uh, in logistics and marketing services. Uh, are those you know some of those untradable? They're specialized financial services because uh, uh, financing uh, uh, has a lot of asymmetric information issues, uh, and therefore you know uh, your closeness to producers uh, is important from the point of view uh, of. Uh, 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 or your uh, 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 development of a specific sector, and then the adequate infrastructure, which is a problem of uh, several developing countries. Uh, now, institution building itself is a non-tradable factor, uh, and therefore uh, 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 the importance uh, it's a uh, the importance of learning how to do things uh, 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 is uh, is uh, in terms of institutional development, and, and this is institutions. I would say not only at the state level, but in the interaction between the state and the private sector, uh, and even among private actors, uh, which many times have to organize themselves in, uh, in networks of producers uh, that do have a, a, a very important uh, a, 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 a capacity to promote a, 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 you know, linkages among sectors. Now, the way I, I uh, these two factors mix the learning process and the complementarities led me to, to develop this uh, 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 family of, uh, uh, of typology or this typology of, of different processes of structural change. Uh, uh, and and uh, of course, when you have a strong learning and a strong complementarities, what you, I, I call deep uh, structural transformation. Let's say this is the story of East Asia. Let's say. But on the other hand, you, you, you can have shallow structural transformations uh, where you have a weak learning and weak complementarities. And, and I would say some assembly activities in, uh, in, in value chains uh, today, simple uh, you know, assembly activities in value chains may be uh, one of those cases. Uh, and therefore, when you uh, get into this, uh, it's important to move out into uh, to some of the other categories. Then uh, you have the other mixed cases, uh, uh, what I call the short breath, uh, 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 which you have a strong learning by weak complementarity. For example, is, uh, is, what I, is how I, I view the advanced stages of import substitution in Latin America. That you develop new uh, you know, sectors of production, uh, but uh, uh, that were highly dependent on imports of uh, intermediate and, and capital goods. And therefore they had very weak linkages. Uh, with other domestic activities, and, and what you had is basically short uh, uh, growth of short. Uh, I mean, the, the growth of this sector for a short period of time, and then they stagnated because they didn't have the uh, the capacity to uh, uh, to develop a, a stronger economic growth. And then you have actually the what I call the labor absorbing, which is uh, when you have a, a weak learning but strong complementarities, uh, and this is actually a. An interesting case, I, I, I always refer to, uh, to my country's, um, uh, Colombia, uh, development of, of its coffee economy in the first half of the 20th century uh, as one of those cases of very successful uh, transformation, uh, which was able to you know, generate growth and, you know, based on uh, low skill labor and, and, uh, uh, and, and of course, the expansion of the cultural frontier. Uh, but you know, relatively uh, successful growth. Actually, uh, the point is at what time, uh, you know, those activities can continue to grow. And let's say in the, in the case of Colombia, uh, that the, uh, that process ended up in the middle middle uh, of the 20th century 
and did not generate uh, further uh, economic growth. So um, for me, the you know one basic point uh, is that the um, uh, of a successful development strategy uh, is the uh, is the capacity not only to innovate but to capture um, uh, a significant share in the global value chain. Um, and, and as I said, this is kind of tautological because GDP is nothing else than value added. <laughs> so you are not able to capture value added, therefore the uh, <coughs> growth effects are going to be uh, uh, more limited. Uh, and so maquila activities uh, or low, low, uh, low skill assembly, uh, 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 maybe uh, uh, relatively uh, a weak engine of growth, uh, particularly, uh, among other reasons, not only because you don't get linkages, domestic linkages of a significant character, but also because those activities may be food loose. So they may transfer to another country uh, soon. Um, uh, and therefore, the uh, uh, unless uh, industries are freely anchored in the, in the domestic economy through linkages, uh, you know, then uh, your growth experience may evaporate and you have what well, a, a shallow specialization. Uh, or in my uh, in in my uh, pattern of growth, uh, which is not so. Not all structural transformation, in other words, are good. Uh, it depends on on your capacity to mix these two factors: uh, learning and complementarities uh, in your development process. Now, one issue that is critical um, uh, is uh, is what are the um, uh, the uh, the way you factors of production and your productivity dynamics go, uh, and in this regard, uh, uh, let me say that the uh, 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 that financing is important, uh, uh, and the uh, and therefore the uh, the capacity to uh, finance innovative activities. I'll refer to, uh, to this later uh, in terms of the role of development banks. Uh, but also, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, in developing countries, of course, you have a low skill labor that can be moved, you know, in a kind of a uh, Arthur Lewis pattern to, uh, to, to more dynamic activities. Uh, but of course, you have to, you know, skill uh, that labor in order to be able to go into the more dynamic uh, uh, activities. So the relocation of labor has to be to, to high skill uh, uh, activities, uh, and therefore the uh, 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 your capacity to to skill labor uh, is uh, is crucial in that regard. Uh, and this generates you know the growth productivity links, uh, which you can call, uh, go to uh, call to Nicholas Cardon and, and Berdun, uh, uh, and which uh, uh, let me say. Uh, generate uh, a, a series of alternatives that I, I have here in my presentation. Uh, 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 as a, 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 in terms of the um, a, a, of, of the links between GDP growth and productivity growth, I mean, in, in neoclassical growth models, uh, productivity is exogenous, and then you you generate economic growth. Uh, but in this analysis, you have to mix the two factors. Uh, uh, and, and, uh, and how they mix is crucial from the point of view of your economic dynamics. Uh, first of all, you have the, um, uh, the technology frontier, which is using the uh, terminology of Nicholas Calder, uh, which is a, a, a way, in, a, a, it's one relation in which it is GDP growth that generates uh, productivity growth uh, through uh, a, a incentives to invest, uh, that generate uh, you know a new sectors with a with a stronger capacity to grow, uh, but also you know dynamic economic with scale that are developing you know by by growing etc cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's a, it's a link that goes from growth to productivity and not the reverse. And then you have the um, the macroeconomic uh, uh, balance uh, which I call GGG GG in, in this graph, uh, uh, which is. Uh, uh, of course, uh, one case in which you can say, well, productivity growth uh, is the uh, is the factor that is behind that, but there may be others uh, determining the uh, your macroeconomic balance, uh, as we will see in the next few graphs. There are, of course, cases in which, uh, uh, you know, uh, for example, your technological frontier a function uh, is uh, is not linear, 
uh, and therefore you have a, a low, a, a low levels of economic growth, a very strong uh, a, a growth effects of uh, or, uh, in terms of productivity, but at high levels, uh, you know that process uh, slows down, and therefore you have here, uh, you know, uh, first of all a, a high growth equilibrium, but also a low productivity trap uh, in in the, in the lower levels of economic growth and productivity, uh, and then innovations. Uh, basically imply that uh, uh, your technology frontier function goes up, uh, but this may be temporary. Uh, and therefore, if you are not able to generate new waves of technology, then the, the process goes back. And then uh, when, uh, when there is a technological revolution uh, in your economy, then uh, you know, your equilibrium in terms of growth, uh, GDP growth and productivity growth goes up. But if uh, you are not able to go into new ways of innovation by dynamic efficiency, uh, therefore you, you go back to, uh, to low levels of economic growth. Uh, and then you may have positive uh, shocks uh, 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 in, in your positive macro shocks. And uh, let me say, uh, I, I always think in, in the case of Latin America, uh, as being uh, shocks because of uh, external financing of terms of trade improvements. And therefore you move your GG curve and then you, again, you have higher growth rates with higher productivity growth, but this may also go back uh, uh, to equilibrium. So, so the, uh, uh, I think the, the best experience, what I call dynamic efficiency, basically your capacity to move your technology frontier uh, function uh, more or less in a permanent way in order to generate uh, you know, a, a faster economic growth with faster productivity growth. Now, in terms of natural resources, uh, uh, a typical problem, of course, for Latin America, but also for many African and Middle, East, uh, Middle Eastern economies, uh, I guess South Africa being uh, one of those cases, uh, is the long debate uh, on the Dutch disease. Uh, and, um, and in that regard, there are three issues that uh, are important. The first one is economic structure. The fact that uh, uh, these are not necessarily sectors uh, with, a, uh, with a capacity to generate uh, fast economic growth, as I have uh, uh, made clear in my presentation. Uh, so uh, technological upgrading and, and linkages to other activities, including particular manufacturing and services, uh, is, uh, is critical to be able to, to generate uh, dynamic economic structure. The second is the macroeconomic vulnerability, which I will uh, uh, refer to in, in, uh, in, in, a, in a couple of minutes, uh, which is the, the, the fact that you have price volatility uh, and also capital account volatility, uh, and therefore your capacity to, uh, to generate uh, you know, counter-cyclical policies in order to compensate for that uh, is, uh, of course, critical. And then there's uh, finally the political economy issue uh, or whether you you you, front, you generate rent rent a rentier economy, uh, which has uh, adverse uh, political economy effects. This, of course, the fact that you know volatility of commodity prices. Uh, in my work uh, uh, on commodity prices, uh, 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 we see that there are some long cycles. Uh, uh, but the, you can see here in the the most recent cycle, uh, since the um, early 21st century, the, you you have this. Uh, a, a commodity boom, let's say from 2006 uh, to 2014, uh, which was shortly interrupted by the uh, uh, by the global financial crisis, and then you have, of course, the downward trend uh, that followed in in 2004-2005. This is, of course, was critical for Latin America, uh, you know, being a national, particularly for South America, being a natural uh, resource dependent uh, part of the world economy. Uh, so it has a faster growth in, let's say, from 2004, 2005 to 2014, and then declining growth uh, in the rest of the, uh, the 20, 2010s. Now, last year, interestingly, uh, uh, commodity prices did not decline, um, except for oil uh, for fuels. Uh, you see, non-fuel basically did not show a significant decline. And then, since the second half of last year, we have this boom in commodity prices, and there has been uh, a question uh, or a literature that, ha that says that maybe we're going to, to experience another super cycle of commodity prices, like the one we had between 2004 to, or 2005 and 2014. 
this is a question uh, issue that uh, we may refer to in the questions and answers. Now, the problem with the commodity price is that this may be the only uh, strategy available for low-income countries and some middle-income countries. Uh, and the complementarity with China and East Asia is, of course, uh, uh, a, a, a very important positive factor in that regard. So the, the crucial question uh, is whether there are uh, the possibility of using natural resources as an engine of growth. Uh, and then um, uh, there are some alternatives that, uh, that some of the natural resource dependent economies have to uh, take into account. Uh, the first one is where you know, there are the technology uh, elements of natural resources, the biotechnology, nanotechnology, the environmentally friendly products today are very important. Uh, the, the capacity to, uh, to develop uh, customized products, uh, uh, which some producers uh, uh, are doing, uh, and therefore to increase the, you know, the, the price of those commodities. For example, my country, with the, particularly with the rise of Vietnam as a coffee producer, uh, has been specializing in high quality coffees. Uh, and you can think of, of uh, a stand, you know, specific, uh, even mineral products that you adapt uh, for specific uh, commodity markets. Um, now, this is of course, a, is a big challenge uh, that uh, I, I is not only successful, uh, you know, in relation to uh, the opportunities for manufacturing and increasing the for service. Now, uh, this is to, to my, uh, by my third issue, which is the macroeconomic and financial dimensions. Uh, uh, and I guess I, I'll be a bit short uh, in this regard because I have taken too long in the previous uh, two parts of the presentation. Um, uh, uh, to uh, point out that uh, uh, one of the problems developing countries face uh, is uh, that some do not have access to external financing, uh, but the others, uh, they say the emerging economies, uh, uh, do have access, but in a very uh, procyclical way. Uh, so the you know you get financial booms uh, followed by sudden stops in financing, uh, and how to manage the macroeconomic effects uh, those boom bust cycles uh, is uh, is absolutely critical from the point of view or economy, uh, and particularly uh, uh, your capacity to, uh, uh, in a sense, to to adopt counter cyclical policies. Uh, which means that during booms, uh, you try to uh, reduce the amount of external financing available uh, a, a, in order to be able to have the capacity to expand uh, during crisis. For example, during booms, uh, you accumulate a large amount of foreign exchange reserves. Uh, you try to avoid the end, uh, the, uh, through capital controls, the, uh, uh, um, the, the entry of uh, volatile, very volatile capital. Uh, and therefore, when uh, you get into, uh, into the crisis, you have the uh, a, a room of maneuver associated to the large amount of foreign exchange reserve you have accumulated. But at the same time, you don't have the, the, uh, the, uh, the flight of capital uh, associated to the worst forms of uh, sudden stops in finance. Now, uh, then of course, uh, uh, you have the uh, in commodity producers, the uh, the, the fact that the commodity prices uh, do generate an additional uh, a, a, you know, procyclical uh, effect. And therefore you have, to, you have to have the capacity to do counter cyclical policy during the commodity booms in order to be able to have a, a larger room of maneuver to manage uh, a, a, the, uh, the crisis that follows when commodity prices fall. Now in terms of financing, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, you can see here the portfolio flows have been very volatile for the, this is the 2014 2019 period uh, you know with some periods in which you have negative particular look at this 2015 2016 this is by the way was very much associated to a flight of capital from china uh, 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 but then other periods in which you have you know booms followed by bust in financing uh, a portfolio uh, and interestingly, uh, 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 last year, uh, in contrast to uh, to expectation that uh, you will have, we will have a, a maybe uh, you know a, a, a very strong uh, uh, a sudden stop in external financing. Uh, the situation was not bad, 
Uh, you, we did have a, a sudden stop, in, particularly in February and March. Uh, it extended for equity for a few more months. But in, in hard currency bonds, uh, the, the crisis was very short. Uh, basically concentrated in March, uh, since mid-April, uh, emerging economies have access to high, uh, high currency bonds. But look at the, uh, and then since then, uh, and then the two other bonds, which are basically uh, investments in domestic bond markets in, uh, in countries, uh, they also turned positive uh, in July. Uh, and basically bond financing has been uh, positive uh, since mid-April of last year. But look at the equity flows, very volatile, uh, you know, with a huge reduction in, uh, uh, in, in, in March, but also in February, April, and May of last year. And then this boom at the end of uh, last year. So the equity flows have been extremely volatile uh, and, and could have generated uh, a significant macro, procyclical macroeconomic effects uh, that we have learned to, to manage. Uh, so the uh, what this means, um, uh, in my view, is that uh, relying on external financing uh, does have it does generate opportunities, uh, although you have to manage your procyclical effects. But the importance of development banks, uh, uh, which is an issue which I have been working on for uh, in, in recent years, is quite critical. Uh, so the development of good development banks, but by the way, development banks were out of fashion for some time, uh, but they have come back with force. Uh, I would say uh, even in the World Bank views, uh, uh, the World Bank was, of course, uh, when you look back in the 1980s, 1990s, the, the big enemy uh, of uh, development banks, of national development banks, uh, is, which I, as, as I always refer to in my talks in the World Bank, it was paradoxical that a development bank, because the World Bank is a development bank, uh, was against national development banks. So it's a development bank uh, that was against development banks, a very contradictory view uh, uh, for the institution. In any case, uh, it, it has come uh, into fashion again uh, since the 2008-2009 global financial crisis. Uh, and today there's a, a growing literature on the role of national development banks and, in, and global development banks, uh, which is uh, you know, quite, quite important. I would say the, uh, uh, in my work on national development banks, uh, uh, I have underscored uh, you know, in the book that I edited a couple of years ago with Stephanie Griffith Young, uh, you know, at least these uh, five functions, they, you know, they, provide, they should provide contraceptive finance, uh, they support activities that, that help historical transformation, innovative activities. Uh, then uh, deepen and improve financial market, for example, help develop uh, domestic bond markets. Uh, 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 and then you have the inclusive uh, finance uh, by support uh, of uh, small firms. Uh, and, uh, and last but not least, the finance of global public goods. Uh, with the uh, uh, mitigation of climate change being, uh, mitigation of adaptation to climate change uh, being uh, a crucial issue today. And last, in, in, but not least in, in terms of macroeconomics, uh, you know, these boom bust cycles, both in terms of finance uh, and in terms uh, of, um, uh, of terms of trade, uh, do generate, uh, you know, instability in the, in the real exchange rates. Uh, uh, which uh, uh, do generate uh, uh, a significant negative factors uh, 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 that, uh, 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 and I think there's a growing literature going back, uh, you know, again, from uh, uh, to the work of Lani Roderick and others about 15 years ago, uh, which emphasized the, uh, the importance of a more stable real exchange rate but also competitive uh, real exchange rates uh, as an instrument that, that facilitates uh, a better uh, insertion into the global economy. So the instability of real exchange rates uh, can be a very negative factor. And against uh, uh, the macroeconomic uh, management, uh, they say the capacity to counter cyclical macroeconomic policies has to include the capacity to stabilize your real exchange rate uh, somewhat uh, so that it doesn't follow uh, a, a boom bust cycles in finance, uh, but it doesn't follow uh, a, the, uh, the shocks associated with the terms of trade. Uh, okay. Well, 
this is my my summary in terms of policy implications. Um, so you have to uh, you you have to have, of course, uh, uh, what they call background uh, conditions, uh, good infrastructure, good education systems. Uh, but uh, the essence of industrial policy is to support the structural transformation uh, uh, by supporting new industries and production clusters, so innovations and complementarities. Uh, in a global economy, uh, that is, it should be closely associated to the diversification of your exports, uh, but also to the development of domestic linkages of those exports, uh, in, including when FDI uh, is present in your economies. Uh, and then beyond that, uh, you have to develop innovation systems or science and technology systems that, uh, that they build up a capacity to innovate, uh, which of course initially start by adapting innovation, but, uh, but gradually moves into becoming a, a secondary innovator or a first quality innovator um, in, in that regard. Uh, and then, um, Understanding that, that this is not a once and for all process that you have to do, it's a constant process and it's not necessarily smooth because you have you at the same time you create activities, you destroy activities. So there's a creative destruction that uh, has to be taken into account. Uh, domestic conditions matter, uh, give the opportunities, but uh, uh, but the the big challenge of industrial policy is how to you know, move into uh, activity that you have not developed before. Uh, so you have to learn, uh, you know, to create comparative advantages, as I have mentioned too. Uh, uh, and, uh, uh, and therefore, uh, uh, how to do that uh, uh, is a very complex issue that may relate to uh, also to uh, the opportunity you have in global markets. Uh, 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 for example, the, you know, uh, the opportunity generated by the rise of East Asia, but also, uh, and very importantly for Latin America, the, the regional integration processes uh, as an opportunity to, uh, to generate uh, regional clusters uh, and regional value chains uh, uh, with a, a growing trade in, uh, in manufacturing and services. Uh, and, and let me say in that regard that, the, uh, uh, that we may have already entered into a period of low uh, uh, growth of world trade. Uh, this is my a simple description of the four major phases uh, of, uh, a, of world trade in the post-war period. Uh, you know, two booms uh, in 1950, 1974, and then 1986-2007. Uh, then you have a, a here a slowdown uh, that actually coincides with the uh, the oil shock of uh, and, and how it generated a slowdown in the in the developed countries. But look at this uh, since. Uh, uh, the global financial crisis, uh, we have experienced very low, very slow growth of world trade uh, and therefore, uh, and, and actually world, world GDP. So the, the, we are experiencing, we have been experiencing for more than 10 years, uh, a, a period of low uh, world economic growth, uh, world trade growth. Uh, and therefore the, uh, you know, significant issue going forward uh, is how uh, 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 we develop uh, how we mix domestic markets and regional markets uh, with global uh, 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 trade. And I, I must say that the, uh, for Africa or for Latin America, uh, that is closely associated to issue of regional integration as an engine of growth uh, in, in, in the light of the very uh, uh, less attractive uh, boom of growth of international trade. And on top of that, uh, you have to mix uh, uh, these uh, structural transformation policies with good macroeconomic policies. Uh, and in that regard, uh, uh, I have emphasized uh, uh, two basic points. Uh, first of all, how uh, you uh, uh, generate the, the policy space for macro, countercyclical macroeconomic policies uh, is a very important point. Uh, which is uh, means managing your boom bust cycles in finance, uh, as well as, as your uh, uh, terms of trade in the case of commodity exporters. Uh, so, how do you uh, use the booms in in, terms, in the terms of trade and in financing uh, in order uh, uh, in order to create uh, capabilities to be able to manage countercyclical policies 
during the succeeding uh, uh, recession or sudden stopping financing or uh, falling commodity prices. And at the national level in terms of financing, uh, how you develop national development banks, uh, which can play a significant role uh, in terms of innovation, but also in terms of uh, uh, different aspects uh, of your development, such as inclusive finance uh, in different forms. Uh, with this, uh, let me conclude my presentation. Thank you very much. <laughs>